Go ahead and get started. Good evening. I'm Tim Gibbs with the Academy DPHA, and I'm joined by my colleague and co-host, uh, Christy Hadley from the Sussex County Health Coalition. Uh, if I click on the right place, I will actually advance my slides. There we go. Social media tags about the program, the program goals, and I know you all have heard these at least four times now. Uh, the housekeeping tips, you all are familiar with this. Remember, use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. We'll defer, uh, we'll answer some of them on the fly between Christy and I. The rest we'll save for the presenter at the end of her presentation this evening. Uh, we'll make an attempt to answer all questions. You do need to stay through the entire presentation, but once we get to the Q&A, you can take off. I will say that as usual, most of the good stuff comes out in the in the Q and A. Um, over to Christy for the Sussex County Health Coalition. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Um, everyone has kind of heard our spiel about what we do at Sussex County Health Coalition. We're really just here to be collaborative partners with our communities to make sure that we're still family focused and improve the health care of all the children, youth, and families in our communities. Next slide. No, sorry, I'm answering a question, trying to multi okay. Um, Tim um, usually touches a little bit on the Delaware Youth Medical Academy. It's recognition for attending those many medical school sessions. So for each session, you receive points and six sessions, um, one full series or six sessions over a multiple series gets you 30 points and six badges. And as you can see, um, for each level that you uh, for every point that you get puts you into a specific level. In each of those levels, you receive certain um, extras. Yep, and for those of you who are already uh, Youth Academy members, you should have gotten uh, decals and your lapel pins or what, however you want to use your pin. Anyway. So this week, we have Krista Kroll Bush, who is going to be talking to us about genetic counseling. And then next week, we have Jordan Weissman coming to us from AmeriHealth Caritas, talking to us about managed care behavioral health interventions. And this evening's presenter is Krista Kroll Bush. She is a licensed pediatric genetic counselor at Nemours Children's Health. She graduated from Arcadia University, which is now the University of Pennsylvania's genetic counseling program, which was in 2019. She started her career at Penn State Health, working as the Four Diamonds Pediatric Oncology Genetic Counselor, where she started the Cancer Predisposition Clinic, the Neurofibromatosis Type 1 Multidisciplinary Clinic, and the Benign Hemogenetic Testing Program. Boy, that was a mouthful. Yeah. She joined Nemours in 2021, continuing to work in her specialty of pediatric oncology and then Nemours Children's Cancer Genetics Program, as well as working in the Genetic Testing Stewardship Program, where she sees patients for a variety of indications, including bleeding disorders, such as hemophilia. Krista, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. And, and Krista, I too went to Arcadia for a uh, graduate degree, so go Knights. Oh, very cool. <laughs> All right, let me stop share. Over to you. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. Um, so hi, everybody. Um, like mentioned, my name is Krista. I work as a genetic counselor at Nemours Children's Health. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, one of my favorite questions that my uh, young adult patients ask me, what the heck is a genetic counselor? Um, so what is a genetic counselor? Um, the best way to put it is we are medical professionals who do a lot more than probably we're described to do. <laughs> um, so what it boils down to is we educate um, both patients, families, um, and the public about genetics. Um, we help estimate different risks for diseases. 
Um, we help provide emotional support to families that are going through the genetic testing process or have genetic conditions. Um, we help guide patients and families through the genetic testing process from beginning to end um, and help give them as much information as they need to help make an informed decision for themselves. Um, so what, whether that is, yes, I want to do genetic testing or no, I don't, or I don't want to know this information, um, or if they've had genetic testing done before and they don't understand their results, we help them um, make those decisions. We also help interpret genetic test results, both for patients, providers, um, and for um, sometimes if you work in a laboratory, you'll also help um, interpret results there. Um, we also do work with patient support groups. So a lot of genetic conditions, um, if like most families kind of start some sort of support group that can grow into an actual um, recognized organization. And a lot of these conditions will also have like a board of genetic counseling um, that helps advise um, on different updates for the condition um, or medical management and screening. So a lot of um, genetic counselors work with those support groups. We also love those support groups because they give us a lot of resources to provide to our patients. Um, we also help explain the, the treatment and management options after a diagnosis happens um, and help patients um, kind of work their way through the medical system because it can be hard to navigate insurance um, and figuring out what medical providers you need to see now that you have this diagnosis. We help patients through that. Um, and then we also just describe the different types of surveillance prevention um, that can happen, um, as well as get patients in touch with research if that's indicated. So that's as simple as I could probably describe my job, which is complex. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to start first by uh, showing you guys the different types of career opportunities um, before diving more into what a genetic counselor does. Um, so most people think um, that in genetic counseling, if you've heard of it before, a lot of times it's, oh, well, you see patients in clinic. Um, but we can actually do a lot more with our scope of practice. A lot of genetic counselors do mostly work in a clinical setting, seeing patients um, but you can also work in a laboratory, like I mentioned. You can be the one that's analyzing reports. Um, you can be the one that, that is trying to classify the different types of mutations that we find when doing testing. Um, you can work in research, which I part of my job is also working a little bit in research. Um, you can be part of developing research and um, like protocols and working on submitting IRBs. You can be the one that's consenting patients. Um, you can be the one that's uh, gathering data or doing the publishing for papers. Um, you can work in academia, whether that is um, teaching courses kind of like this, or if you want to teach um, future genetic counselors. Um, you, like I mentioned before, can work with patient organizations and um, uh, other like charities um, that do provide resources to individuals with genetic conditions. You can work in healthcare administration, helping to um, advocate throughout a hospital for patients, um, public health policies and lobbying um, like the government to provide funds for research. Or um, recently there's a lot of genetic counselors who are trying to get some policies put in place so that we get better reimbursement from like Medicare and Medicaid so we can see more patients. Um, so the career possibilities are kind of endless for us. Um, but since the majority of genetic counselors do work in um, clinic, I figured I'd focus a little bit on that because that's also what I do. Um, so there are three primary specialty areas for genetic counselors. Um, so these are kind of the classic ones. There's prenatal, pediatric, and oncology or cancer. So um, starting out with genetic counseling, these are the ones that you have to learn about in school. These are the ones um, that were kind of the first areas that genetic counselors kind of got involved in. Um, the first being prenatal, but now it's kind of expanded. So prenatal does not include just seeing people who are pregnant, but it can be if you're having fertility issues. It could be before you are even wanting to have a child, you go see a genetic counselor to get preconception genetic counseling. Um, there's also high-risk clinics. 
Um, so that field has expanded. Then pediatrics, you can see, it probably has the most listed underneath there, but there are many, many, many specialties that you can go into if you work in pediatrics, whether that is just working in general pediatrics, um, working with a geneticist to see any different type of indication, or you can subspecialize and work in something like cardiology or neurology, um, working only with those types of patients. Um, and then my favorite category, but I'm a little biased, is oncology. And that is really just split up into adult patients and pediatric patients. So the vast majority of genetic counselors who work in oncology work with adult patients, but a few um, do work in pediatrics like myself. Um, and every year there's more and more sub specialties that are popping up um, or even more um, focused areas for genetic counselors. So this is always one thing that I like to include because I think it's a pretty fun fact um, is that genetic counselors um, was named one of the uh, 25 amazing healthcare support jobs. Um, and we do typically have a pretty high satisfaction um, for our jobs. So there's multiple surveys that occur. One that happens, I believe it's every year um, through the National Society of Genetic Counselors where we get to um, do a survey that indicates like our salary range and how satisfied with our job we are, if we're burnt out or not. Um, and continually, we have pretty good um, satisfaction with our jobs across the board. Um, this was just taken recently from, um, I think the US News. Um, we are ranked number one in best healthcare support jobs currently and number 14 um, out of 100 best jobs. I don't know how many jobs were included in that 100 best jobs, so that could be a little bit biased though. Um, but then you can also see the scorecard. We do make a pretty decent salary. Um, the job market for us is pretty good and um, the future growth for our field is really good. Um, there's always projected genetic counselors are needed in many era, areas, sorry. Um, and a lot of hospitals are trying to hire for genetic counseling. So we're hoping to see a lot more growth in our field in the next few years. Um, the stress, depending on what field you work in in genetic counseling can be um, pretty good. And there's always a really good work-life balance with our jobs. Um, one thing I do like to be pretty realistic about um, is the salary. So this is a chart of what the salary, the average salary for a genetic counselor is from um, 2012 to 2021. So it has been steadily increasing during COVID. Of course, it went down a bit. Um, but starting out salaries uh, after you graduate can range anywhere from about 65, 70,000 up to like 80,000, I think. Um, and then the further along you get in your career, the more money that you can make. I believe that average right now in Delaware is probably hovering around 90. Um, so at least this chart is decently accurate for Delaware. Okay, so that just kind of gives you a summary of what um, the career opportunities are in genetic counseling. I always like to start with that just so you guys can get a sense of what is out there before I dive into what exactly I do. So what does a genetic counselor do? Um, so there are many reasons to see a genetic counselor, and the this is not an exhaustive list but this is at least some of the major things to come see a genetic counselor for. So um, anybody who is pregnant or wants to consider pregnancy. So sometimes, like I had mentioned before, preconception genetic counseling so that you can get carrier testing to see if you are a carrier for a genetic condition and if your partner is. So that's things like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease. You can get testing beforehand um, or before getting pregnant to see, are you a carrier? And is this something that you could pass on to your child so that you're aware of that? Or during pregnancy, we can also screen for certain conditions, um, things like Down syndrome, um, or we can even do more invasive testing if there are issues or family history of something. Um, if somebody was diagnosed with cancer or they have a significant family history of cancer, that's also something that a genetic counselor um, should be involved in that patient's care. If you, your child or a family member was recently diagnosed with, with a genetic condition, often a lot of our referrals are for family members um, of somebody who has a positive genetic test result. 
if you, your child or a family member have a medical history that's concerning for a genetic condition. So certain things like having a family history of cancer, or if somebody has a heart condition that's running in their family, if somebody has diabetes and every single generation of their family has diabetes, those can be indications for um, talking with the genetic counselor and maybe even doing genetic testing. Um, there is also certain things like physical differences that somebody can have, um, like different facial features, or if someone's arms are a lot shorter than they should be, um, or is typical for someone, um, if something called hemihypertrophy, where one of your legs is shorter than the other or thicker than the other, that can be an indication of a genetic condition. Um, if someone is behind in their milestones, so um, we keep track of children who um, might not be sitting up on time or walking and talking at the typical time frame. If they're delayed in that, that can be an indication for genetic testing. Um, so there are many common conditions that have a genetic cause to them. So they're caused by genetic changes that we inherit from our parents. Um, so some of those are things like cancer, heart disease, having hearing loss, seizures, having a cleft lip or palate, and that is a split in your upper lip, uh, and also the top of your mouth. Um, that's your palate. Some of you, if you have ever had braces or a palate expander, um, that is your palate is up there. Um, if there's developmental delay, like I said, uh, any issues with milestones, sitting, walking, talking. Um, if you have excess bleeding or you abnormally clot, um, whether that's you have clots in like your legs or your lungs, both of those are indications of genetic conditions. Um, if you have early onset strokes or if you have early onset Alzheimer's disease, all of these things um, may have a genetic cause behind them. So uh, something that most people don't know unless you have seen a genetic counselor is what happens during a visit with us. So in any initial genetic counseling visit, the first thing that we do is we talk about why the patient is here, what their understanding is of why they were referred for genetics. Um, sometimes you would be surprised that a lot of people don't know why they were referred to me in the first place. So that's something we talk about. Has their doctor ever talked about this with them? What's their understanding? Um, we then review their personal medical history as well as their family history. And we make, um, essentially a picture of their family tree, which I'll show you in the next slide. Um, we also discuss the different types of um, basic genetic concepts, like what DNA is, what a chromosome and what a gene is, um, what mutations are and how they occur, um, and what exactly the testing will be looking at. So the, um, the testing is different depending on the indication. So we might have to describe what a deletion or a duplication in a gene is, or that we're looking at the spelling of a gene to see if there's any changes from the um, typical A, C, G, T um, alphabet that the gene has. We also do a risk assessment based on the patient's personal history and the family history. So if we're seeing something that's um, physical features or other clinical findings for the patient, sometimes we can give them an estimate for how worried we are that they might have a genetic condition. And then also based on the family history, if something is running in the family, we can kind of give them an estimate as to how likely it is that you might have a genetic condition. Most of the time, there are also different types of genetic testing that we can do for patients. Um, so we can give them a couple different options sometimes if they want to start with more targeted testing for their own symptoms, or if they want to go a little bit more broad, test for more things. Um, so we go over those different types of options with them and see which um, type of test a patient is most comfortable with. Some patients want to know everything and we call that information seeking. Some patients get a little bit more anxious, which is definitely understandable in these types of scenarios. So sometimes we'll start a little bit more targeted to see, can we figure this out just with um, a very small test and then take it stepwise if we need to. Um, we also do informed consent. So especially in certain states, Delaware is one of them that you have to have signed informed consent in order to do genetic testing. And that means the patient has to be very aware of what is being tested for. 
They need to know what, what lab their testing is being sent to, how long it can take um, to get that result back, um, and what the consequences of a positive or negative result could be for them. Um, and then you also have to sign an actual document that says, I'm okay with doing the genetic testing, um, and I'm aware of the different types of results that I can get and the implications. Um, we also go through what's called psychosocial counseling. So we often are asking patients, you know, is what we're talking about causing you any sort of anxiety? Is there any um, other like concerns that you have? Is there any other family situations that you want to talk about that might influence your decision and try to help them through anything um, that they're feeling? Um, we then, on the back end, will help coordinate getting a sample, whether that's in clinic that day, getting a blood draw or um, a buckle sample, which is swiping the inside of someone's cheek to get DNA that way through their saliva, um, and then fill out the test requisition and work with the lab on the back end to um, get the testing in progress. So this is what um, a picture of a family history will typically look like. So um, on this side, the left, I'm thinking you can see my mouse, hopefully. Um, so this is the different types of symbols that um, you can see on a pedigree. So a square is um, a male or man. Um, a circle is a woman or female. And then a diamond is a um, anybody who is non-binary or um, does not have a, an assigned sex at birth. Um, so you can see there's different types of scenarios here. If somebody identifies as a male, um, but they were assigned female at birth, we put a F a B at the bottom so that we are aware, um, that they were assigned female at birth, but they identify as a male that's important for certain risk assessments. Um, so sometimes certain conditions have different implications for anybody who is XX or typically female or XY or typically male. Um, so we need to be aware of somebody's assigned sex at birth. Um, that way uh, we can give them accurate risk assessments. Um, but we always like to draw with whatever um, sex somebody is um, most comfortable being identified as. Um, and then over here, we this is how we are drawing our pedigrees. So up here is um, mom and dad, and then um, down here are all of the siblings. So you can see each one of these lines has a different meaning. So there's a relationship line, which is directly across between the two symbols. So that means um, that some sort of relationship occurred um, that produced children. Um, and then there's the line of descent that we draw down and then across is the sibship line. And that's where all of you um, are connected to your siblings. Um, so I'll show you additional pedigrees um, and examples of that later on in the presentation, but this just kind of gives you an orientation for what's to come. Um, so then we also have a results visit with families. Sometimes that's just a phone call um, to let them know that it, their test results are negative um, and answer any questions. Sometimes even if it is a negative result and we have a lot to talk about, we'll still have a full visit with the family. Um, and most of the time it's a visit to discuss any um, positive or uncertain results. Um, so we walk somebody through their test results, what this means for them, and what the next steps are. Um, we make sure to be very aware of how this could emotionally impact somebody. So sometimes receiving genetic test results can be very hard. Um, and we're always very aware that, you know, this is tough to hear sometimes. Um, and we want to be um, cognizant of that for families. So we help them through the emotional impact of getting results. Um, we review um, the medical management recommendations. So whether that be you have to get certain surveillance, we need to refer you to certain doctors um, or whatever just the next step is from here. We discuss um, how this could impact other family members. So if somebody's positive for something and other family members should be tested so that they're aware um, that they might be at risk for something or if it is a condition where both parents have to be a carrier for it. We talk about the family um, dynamics and how um, if mom and dad wanna have another um, child, the chance that that child could have um, the same genetic condition as their sibling. 
Um, we also refer anybody to the correct healthcare provider, providers, sorry, um, and we plan follow-ups if needed. So a lot of the times um, somebody comes to us for genetic testing and talking about if genetic testing is right for them. Um, and once we have their results visit, sometimes we don't really need to follow patients for a long period of time. Um, it really depends where you work. For me, I do have to follow my patients long-term, um, but sometimes if you um, are just seeing patients in like my on-call portion of my job where I work with um, for example, like an endocrinologist, they're asking me for a test um, for a condition called um, Turner syndrome if their uh, patient has short stature. I just see them, give them their results, um, and then they're managed by an endocrinologist, not me moving forward. But in the um, pediatric cancer portion of my job, I do follow these kids and um, make sure they're um, on time with their management. So it really depends on what the result is and what um, field of genetic counseling you work in. Um, so moving on to showing you guys how you would become a genetic counselor. Um, the process can take a little bit of time, but less than med school. So um, this is typically the academic pathway to um, becoming a genetic counselor. So in order to um, become a genetic counselor, you need a bachelor's degree. You can um, get a bachelor's degree in anything you want. My friend who is a genetic counselor has a bachelor's degree in English. I have another one who got a bachelor's degree in music, um, but you have to have certain prerequisites. So they did that while taking a bunch of science courses. Um, and a bachelor's degree does take four years. Um, after that, you can apply to schools that will give you a master's degree in genetic counseling. Um, this includes uh, clinical training, coursework, and research, um, and getting this master's degree currently takes about two years. Um, there is some discussion of maybe putting this into being a PhD, so at that point, then um, the requirements would change a little bit. Um, once you obtain your master's degree, you can then um, sit for your boards and get your certification and licensure. Um, so in the U.S., that's through the American Board of Genetic Counseling, and then also in Canada or Australia, the Canada um, Board or the Australian Board. Um, and sitting for your boards and getting your certification and licensure only takes um, a couple of months to apply and go through that process. Um, Something that I always do mention to anybody who is looking to apply to genetic counseling school is you should always check to make sure what the program's requirements are. So the programs that I um, was applying to required um, certain uh, levels of psychology classes. Uh, so I had to have two psychology classes, one at level like one, level two, um, i.e. just a freshman course and then like a senior or junior course. Um, and then you also had to take like statistics and calculus. So I had to actually go back and do a couple of courses. So if you're interested in pursuing um, a career in genetic counseling and you're working your way through your bachelor's, um, always check to make sure what the requirements are so you're not missing any courses. Um, so there are genetic counseling programs all across the US. So any of the colored in states in purple here have a genetic counseling program. Um, so you can see they are all across the U.S. Um, I listed some of the programs that are pretty close to Delaware. Delaware currently does not have any programs, um, but Nemours um, is affiliated with both uh, Thomas Jefferson, University of Pennsylvania, Rutgers, and University of Maryland. Um, we have a genetic counseling students that come shadow us from all of those programs. Um, and then there's also a couple others listed in um, like New York, Maryland, there's Johns Hopkins. Um, so there's a bunch of programs around here. Um, so this is just to give you an overview of a, a curriculum that is in a genetic counseling program. Each one is a little bit different of how they approach things, but this is kind of the most typical. Um, so coursework can include, um, it will definitely include human genetics and medical genetics. So the human genetics gives you a baseline for um, the different types of um, basics in genetics that you need to know. Um, so where protein comes from and much more in-depth topics like that. Medical genetics is how you then apply your human genetics um, to patients. So how you identify different genetic conditions, um, looking at dysmorphology or um, differences, um, like physical differences that patients can have if they have a genetic condition, and essentially how to work somebody up for genetic conditions. 
Um, we also learn embryology, which is important for um, if you work in prenatal, needing to know how um, a fetus is formed um, and the different steps of pregnancy um, so that if there is ever a change or a defect in one of the genes that um, goes along with embryology, you're kind of aware of at what step things could be happening. Um, we learn about reproductive genetics and doing um, risk assessments for pregnancies, um, genetic counseling theories, psychosocial counseling. Um, we learn about a different approaches to how to give results, um, how to recognize patients' feelings or if um, they're more um, information seeking or not and how to gauge that um, and give them appropriate guidance. Um, we also just do basic psychology ethics, because um, there is a lot of ethical implications to doing genetic counseling, um, or genetic testing, I should say. Um, we also do specialized classes like cancer genetics, cardiovascular genetics, metabolics, um, biochemical genetics, um, but that's kind of dependent on um, where you go to school. Um, all of your schools will also have a clinical rotation, and you will always have some sort of prenatal um, cancer and pediatric rotations. Um, most places will also do one like specialty rotation. Um, so if you are super interested in cardiology, they'll try to put you with a cardiac genetic counselor if they can. Um, or if you know, you know, I want to do adult cancer, you might get to repeat that rotation. So you can just make sure, um, or, you know, get more experience doing that. Your course will also include research, um, and that is at least one class to help teach you about research topics. Um, sometimes that'll include like how to write up an IRB or just how to even perform research. And then you will also have a thesis, um, or at least most, I believe most programs do have a thesis project that you have to do. Um, and that is coming up with your own thesis topic, implementing the research, um, gathering all of the data and um, writing up both an abstract and a full report. Um, some places just make you write up the report, some make you present it. Um, so it kind of depends. And then there's also, um, it's called a comp exam. Um, and there are some programs that make you just do a comp exam instead of a thesis, or if you're lucky, then you get both. <laughs> Um, so after you graduate from a genetic counseling program, you can sit for your boards. So you have to graduate and your program director has to say that, you know, you met all the requirements for graduation. Um, and then you can officially apply for the board's examination. Um, it's a four hour test. Um, it doesn't always take the four hours. I was a little anxious during mine. So I took the four hours to look over everything. Um, but it comes with many, many questions. And they these are the five main topics that you'll get questions about. Um, I believe they're updating the board. So the question numbers might change a little bit um, because we're trying to um, not be so outdated with a lot of the questions that we have. Um, so you can get anything from um, different types of genetic condition questions or human development. You can be asked to do a risk assessment um, and basic principles of genetics um, like Hardy Weinberg um, or doing some fun um, math calculations called Bayes analysis um, where you have to figure out a risk based on a, a bunch of different factors. Um, you can get tested on different types of testing interpretation, what different mutations might mean, what testing options are best for certain patients, um, the different types of risk managements, both for reproductive as well as for anybody who has different genetic conditions. So typically you get um, a couple of questions about um, some cancer genetics, some um, pediatrics, some prenatal, and then you'll get some specialty questions. Like on my boards, I had a lot of metabolic questions. On my friends, she had a lot of cardiac. Um, and so it's all a, a different balance of what types of questions you get, but there will definitely be a wide array. So you have to know uh, quite a lot before going into your boards. You'll also get questions about um, different types of counseling skills, how to effectively communicate and educate patients. Um, and then the fun part is um, the legal questions that you get. So there are a lot of ethical and legal implications for genetic testing, whether that becomes um, insurance questions, um, how to approach um, different ethical situations that might happen, um, whether that be a family wants to test a child for an adult onset condition, 
typically that is a rule that we try to follow is that we don't test children for an adult onset condition because it takes away somebody's autonomy. Um, so they don't get to make the decision about if that's something they want to know about. Um, so that's one of the ethical implications for genetic testing is really avoiding testing kids for adult onset conditions if we can. Um, there's, of course, certain situations where that's okay. Um, and then you also get um, questions about professional frameworks and what um, our own genetic counseling um, ethics stand for sometimes. Um, so after you go through your boards and you pass, then sometimes you will have to, depending on the state that you practice in, get licensure. Um, so Delaware being so close to some other states, if you practice in Delaware, typically you at least have a Delaware license if not also New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. Um, and because Nemours also has a um, other hospital in Florida, I also have a Florida license too. Um, so depending on what states you practice in, that means that you have to have a license in that state. Um, I have a friend who lives out in Colorado um, and she does have a Colorado license, um, but she has a license in Pennsylvania and Ohio and Georgia. Um, so it really doesn't matter what state you live in. It really matters what state you practice in. So a lot of genetic counselors who do remote work um, don't actually have a license for the state that they live in, but they only have it for the state that they work in. So if their job is um, completely remote, but it's out of um, Louisiana and they live in Montana, you really only have to have a license in Montana. Um, but there are certain states, um, you can see here, there are certain states where there will be genetic counseling licensure, they just don't have it yet. Um, so like in New York, you don't have to have a license to practice genetic counseling. You have to have a certification and pass your boards, um, but you don't have to apply for licensure just yet. We're working on it though. Um, so this is to give you an overview of my career path, because I think it's kind of helpful to figure out, you know, how somebody else went about this. Um, so I heard about genetic counseling when I was in high school. Um, my mom had told me that she actually um, had a screen in her pregnancy with me, and I um, screened positive for Down syndrome, and she wished she had somebody who she could talk to about the implications for that. Um, but screening tests are not diagnostic tests. I don't have a Down syndrome. She got a diagnostic test um, that helped confirm that, but she wished there was somebody who had guided her through that process um, and what that would look like. Um, so that was the first time that I had heard about, you know, different types of genetic testings or genetic conditions. Um, and from there, I was looking into it more and it sounded like something that I really wanted to do. Um, so I had kept that in mind throughout um, college when I went to Boston University, but I um, didn't really figure out exactly what I wanted to do until I graduated. Um, so after I graduated, I had already been working in a lab at Boston Medical Center. Um, so they needed some help um, with their administrative assistant and lab coordinator. So I started doing that. And then I also um, worked as a research assistant part time. Um, and from there, I was really just um, getting money so that I could go to grad school. So um, I chose to also work at Boston Medical Center because you got tuition reimbursement. And because I hadn't decided I wanted to be a genetic counselor until after I graduated, there were two courses I actually needed to go back and take. Um, so I was able to do them for free um, because of the affiliation with Boston Medical Center and Boston University. So I, while I was working full time, I also took biochem and psychology too. Um, so that I could meet the requirements to apply to um, grad school. Um, I applied to, I believe it was four different grad schools, um, Mount Sinai, Arcadia, which is now Penn, um, Sarah Lawrence, and I think Brandeis, um, which no longer has a program. Um, and then I got interviews at Mount Sinai and at Arcadia. Um, and then I was accepted into Arcadia University, went there for two years. And once I graduated, I got, um, I sat for my boards and um, got a job at Hershey Medical Center. Um, and then I became a, officially a genetic counselor. Um, so after all of that, I have not really explained what I personally do. So I work in um, mostly in pediatric oncology or pediatric cancer. So I see patients who either have a cancer diagnosis 
um, have a family history of cancer or have certain physical features that might be indicative of them having um, a genetic condition that predisposes them to get cancer. Um, so that looks like something um, if you have a lot of birthmarks all over your body, not freckles, not moles, but a distinct birthmark, um, that means that you could have an increased risk for certain um, genetic conditions. Um, if you have very dark freckles all over your lips and the inside of your cheeks, um, that can be indicative. It looks kind of like if you took a Sharpie and just dotted all over your lips. Sometimes that is an indication for a cancer predisposition. Um, but typically what we see is this and um, other physical findings. So if you have any of thing, these things, don't be worried, but you can always ask your doctor um, if they are concerned as well. I always throw that out there because I don't want to make anyone anxious. Um, but I typically see the vast majority of my patients are anyone under the age of 21 who has a cancer diagnosis. Um, and I help organize um, their somatic tumor testing, which is testing the cancer cells to see if there's any genetic changes that can help the doctors provide a diagnosis, um, targeted treatment, um, and um, any sort of management for them moving forward. So the different types of genetics in someone's cancer can be helpful for the doctors to know to give them as best treatment as possible. At the same time, I also do what's called germline genetic testing, and that is testing the DNA that you're born with to see if you, are, um, if you have any genetic changes that you were born with that caused a predisposition for cancer. Um, so it just means that if you were born with a change in one of your genes that typically protects you from getting cancer, um, you might be at an elevated risk compared to the average person to develop cancer. It does not necessarily mean 100% chance, but it means that you have that risk and there are things that I do to help, um, whether that is imaging, certain screenings or blood work. There are certain things that we do to either help prevent cancer from happening or catch it super early. That way the treatment outcomes are way better because typically the earlier you can catch cancer diagnosis, the better the outcomes are. So that just gives a little summary of what I do um, most days. Okay, so I have a few cases um, to go through with you guys that I think will be helpful to really picture what exactly a genetic counselor does, mostly in a clinical setting. Um, so this is a pediatric case. Um, so this was a 15 month old male that I saw. He was referred to ENT or otolaryngology um, due to him failing his newborn hearing screen. Um, so at birth, all children um, in the US, um, depending on the state, they get a heel prick where we take a little bit of their blood and they get screened for certain genetic conditions. And then you also get a hearing test. So right after um, birth, um, I believe it's a couple hours after birth, they put little headphones on um, the baby um, and they are able to test their hearing to see um, if structurally the ear is sound, but also if they're um, receiving sound. Um, and so he failed his newborn hearing screen. Um, he was then sent to audiology to get a repeat test for hearing. Um, and they determined that he had bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. So there are different categories of um, hearing loss, whether that be mild, moderate, or severe. Um, and his was sensory neural hearing loss, which was moderate in both ears. Um, from there, our ENT department is very good um, and they referred us to us for some genetic testing. Um, so I saw this patient and I took a family history. And as you can see, he does not have a family history of anything. He was the first person in his family to have any type of hearing loss. And there was no other major um, medical conditions running in his family. Um, so you can see here that he has um, a sister and a brother. Um, his mom and dad, his mom has a brother who has two kids and his dad has a sister and a brother, both with one boy each. Um, and nobody was reported to have any health conditions other than my patient who had hearing loss. So what do we know about this patient? Um, right now, we know that he has bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Um, if you uh, go through school, you'll learn more. But if you are born having some sort of hearing loss, there's up to an 80% chance that you might have a genetic condition that caused it. Um, and that can be either autosomal recessive, 
um, where it is um, both of your parents are a carrier for something and they pass it on to you. And that's when you show symptoms, but carriers don't. Or for this patient, because there is no family history of hearing loss, it could be something that's de novo or brand new. So de novo just means brand new in Latin. And that's what we refer to um, mutations that occur and somebody is the first person in their family to have it. We call it a de novo mutation or just a brand new mutation. Um, so those were the things that were on my mind is he was, um, he failed his newborn hearing screen. He failed it again, which likely means he was born with some sort of hearing loss. Um, and that either based on the family history, this was either an autosomal recessive condition or it was brand new in this child. Um, his, he had no other relevant medical history. Um, he had an MRI of his head because there can be physical differences inside of the ear and that was normal. And he also didn't have an infection history. Um, so sometimes um, children who were exposed to um, CMV when they're um, in utero, um, or when a mom is pregnant and she has CMV, that can cause hearing loss in a child or something like meningitis. Certain things can, um, if you have that infection, can cause hearing loss, but he didn't have any history of that. Um, so after kind of going through this checklist in my head, I was trying to think of what testing should we send for him. So should I just send a testing that tests only for things related to hearing loss? Um, should I test more targeted? There are certain genetic conditions that we first think of, like um, something called Pendrid, where it's autosomal recessive hearing loss. That tends to be one of the more common um, conditions that can cause hearing loss in children. Um, or should I send a really broad panel? Could I also do something called a microarray to look for any deletions or duplications in his genes that would also explain this? Um, so after looking at the family history and looking for the indication, I decided to do a broad hearing loss panel that could look for anything related to hearing loss. Um, and this is the patient's genetic testing results. Um, so he was found to have um, genetic mutation in both copies of his USH2A gene. Um, so on one copy, he has a partial deletion that this um, panel picked up. And then on the other copy, he has um, a missense variant, or sorry, a nonsense variant. Um, so USH2A is related to a genetic condition called Usher syndrome. Um, so this is just to show you what a report, a genetic testing report can look like. It gives you, um, I think over here, um, so it can give you what type of test you ordered, the different result that you can have. It lists out the different types of results that were found. I blocked out the other two because they weren't as relevant and for um, confidentiality sake. It gives you an interpretation of what um, these results might mean. Um, and then it typically gives you a quick little summary on this first page of um, what the condition is that was found and then the recommendations or next steps. Um, so next steps for him was genetic counseling um, and targeted testing for family members. On the next page of the report, it will also give you a summary about um, the gene, what that gene has been found to be in relation to. So this gene has been found in relation to Usher syndrome type 2A. Um, and it gives you a little bit of a summary about that. It also gives you details about the exact mutation that was found. Um, so you can see here, it shows you um, that this is a common pathogenic variant um, and um, that it has been observed often in patients who do have Usher syndrome. It's a frame shift variant, which means that essentially the spelling of the gene has been pushed down. Um, so it no longer spells things out correctly. It's as if you took a sentence and you deleted the first three letters, you now can't really read the sentence properly. Um, and then it also discusses the deletion that was found um, and how this is a pretty rare deletion and it hasn't been previously reported in the literature. So a lot of the different mutations that we find, we then publish about them so that everybody else can be aware of, hey, we found this mutation in a certain patient. So when it's a new um, mutation that hasn't been seen before, that can sometimes be an indication that, you know, this is something that is causing this condition and it's rare and that's something that should be published about so other people can know about it. Um, so this is a table that um, shows the different types of Usher syndrome. So there's three types. Um, our patient had type two, which is moderate to severe hearing loss from birth. Usher syndrome also causes progressive vision loss over time. 
So um, this vision loss typically starts in late childhood to early teens and gradually worsens um, to typically patients will become blind. Um, Sometimes certain types of Usher syndrome can also cause balance issues. That's typically only type one um, and type three. Um, but all Usher syndrome will have some type of hearing loss as well as um, some type of vision loss. But the vast majority of patients will become both deaf and blind. And this is not um, what Helen Keller had. A lot of people ask me that. She um, had infections in childhood, which caused her to lose her sight um, and her hearing, but she did not have Usher syndrome. Um, the reason that genetic testing for children can be super important and to figure out in particular for this child that um, he did have Usher syndrome type 2a is because there are certain advances in treatment. So now that we know about all of these genetic conditions, researchers have been trying to figure out, is there a way that we can do something to help these children no longer have certain symptoms associated with the condition? So there's a lot of clinical trials currently for Usher syndrome. Um, there are two in particular that are pretty promising. One is an oral drug um, that can help with the eyesight for Usher syndrome. So if um, you are taking this drug, it's currently in phase one and phase two trials, which means it's come out of um, animal testing. Um, they're seeing that a lot of what's called retinitis pigmentosa, and that is the progressive hearing loss, uh, sorry, vision loss. Um, they are seeing improvement or a delay in that so that the vision loss is not either as severe or sometimes doesn't happen. Um, and hopefully with this, you know, drug that's being put in um, place, we will see that it eventually comes on the market and can help m many more patients. So because this patient was only 15 months when they were diagnosed, um, hopefully by the time that the, they are starting to show signs of vision loss, um, this drug will be on the market and can actually help them. Um, and you can see there's other um, clinical trials that I put up on here too. Um, one in particular is for one of the variants that this patient was found to have, but it's preclinical trials. Um, so um, it hasn't gone into um, human testing just yet, um, but it's using something called CRISPR to do gene editing, which is something that a lot of people are doing research in for many genetic conditions. Um, and that is just for Usher syndrome type 2a, but there are also some clinical trials for gene independent treatment. So that means um, no matter what genetic mutation you have or what gene it's in, um, if you have Usher syndrome type 1, 2, or 3, you can take um, these types uh, or be um, involved in this clinical trial for um, mostly retinitis pigmentosa. Um, so the vision loss that can occur, um, there are many, many, many clinical trials that are um, in process to help um, individuals who have retinitis pigmentosa and return a vision or at least stop the progression. Um, so the ca second case I have is um, a cancer case. So this was my a patient who was a 15-year-old female. She presented originally to the ER due to um, increased leg pain and swelling that had been going on for about two weeks. Um, she had noticed um, that one of her legs was getting a little bit bigger than the other for about a month, but then started to have increased pain. That's when she brought it to her parents' attention. Um, in the ER, she had imaging and it identified a mass on her left leg. Um, and she went um, and was admitted. We got her into surgery and they did a biopsy and um, pathology determined that this was a sarcoma. Um, so any patient who has a sarcoma um, is, and is under the age of 18 typically gets referred for genetic counseling. So I saw this patient and I talked with her family and got a family history and she did have a significant family history of cancer. So her mom had what's called a neuroblastoma that was diagnosed at age four. And that is a tumor that can occur um, mostly within your abdomen and your spinal region. Um, and it develops on nerves. Um, and it's just a tiny little solid tumor that can happen. She was diagnosed at age four and had been in remission um, for, I believe it was over 30 years. Um, I, I can't remember her exact age, but I'm, I think that was right. Um, her this patient's aunt had breast cancer that was diagnosed at 34 and she passed away from that. Um, her uncle also, also had an osteosarcoma that was diagnosed at age 18 and that is a type of bone cancer. 
And then he was also very recently diagnosed with a brain tumor at age 36. Um, this patient's grandfather had a brain tumor. She had a family history of early onset um, leukemia, brain tumors, breast cancer. So all of this was making me pretty suspicious that there was a um, genetic condition running in the family. Um, so I always go back to what do we know about this patient and what is our knowledge? So we know this patient has a sarcoma and she is 15, which means that there is a likely um, cause behind it. So anybody who has a sarcoma, that's one of the indications that makes us suspicious for a cancer predisposition. Additionally, she had a family history of early onset cancers, which makes us even more suspicious because that's one of the little red flags that we look out for is anybody who was diagnosed with cancer um, before the typical age of onset. So any cancers that are diagnosed over the age of like 50 to 60, that is a typical age to get cancer. So if you are diagnosed before then, that could be a red flag. Um, and one of the things that you'll learn in school is there are certain criteria um, that if you meet criteria uh, based on your personal and family history, that's very indicative of genetic uh, testing. So one of them is called Champre criteria, and that is for something called Lee-Fermini syndrome. And this patient just about met that criteria. Um, so you have to have a uh, diagnosis of cancer under the age of 46, plus a first degree relative that also has a certain type of cancer. Um, and she was diagnosed at 15, um, and none of her first degree relatives had, um, the specific type of cancer, but both her aunt and her uncle did. Um, so that was enough for me to be like, she needs some genetic testing. Um, so the types of testing that I sent for her was genetic testing on her tumor. Um, we sent a dedicated, um, what's called a sarcoma panel. Um, and so it's just, um, essentially we send this to a lab that knows, um, how to look for things that are common in sarcomas. So we sent that to help aid in, um, a specific diagnosis. So to help aid in what type of sarcoma she had, as well as, is there any targeted treatments that we can give to her? Um, and it also helps with the prognosis. Is this a severe high risk or is this something um, that might have an easier course of treatment? And then as far as the genetic testing for things that she could have been born with, one of the things that was top of my mind was Lee-Fermini syndrome. But I also, any child who has a type of cancer, I try to um, order more broad testing to catch anything that I possibly can. So this is the patient's genetic test report. Um, so you can see I ordered quite a few genes for them, about 47, um, and she came back positive for um, a mutation in the TP53 gene, and that is what cause, uh, causes Lee-Fermini syndrome. So this patient does have Lee-Fermini syndrome. Um, so Lee-Fermini syndrome is a hereditary cancer predisposition um, that a, a causes a lifetime cancer risk um, for XY individuals or typical biological males um, of over 70%. And then um, for XX individuals or um, typically um, assigned female at birth, um, it's, it's much higher because of the risk for breast cancer. So um, it, uh, it's even more probably than 90%. It's almost close to 100 for um, XS, XX individuals. So Lee-Fermini syndrome is caused by mutations in the TP53 gene. Um, and most people refer to this as like the gatekeeper of the genome because it's one of the main key factors in controlling cell growth and proliferation. So it's one of the things um, that creates, it's one of the things, one of the genes that creates a protein and that protein's main job is to make sure your cells don't grow out of control. So when it's no longer able to do its job, the cells can kind of um, just snowball. Um, and that's most of the time what creates a tumor. Um, so while I say that the lifetime risk is between 70 to 90%, we can break it down further. So in childhood, there's about a 25% chance to develop cancer or one in four individuals who have Lee-Fermini syndrome. By age 30, it's 50% or one half of individuals. And then by age 60, it's 80 to 90% of people will have developed cancer at least once in their lifetime. Um, and there are certain types of cancers. Like I mentioned before, there are certain things that we look out for for them to meet criteria. Um, and we refer to that as the Bs or bone cancer, brain tumors, breast cancer, blood cancers like leukemias or lymphomas, um, and then sarcomas. So that's why 
this patient had a sarcoma, and one of the first things I thought about was Lieberman syndrome. Um, there are screenings that we do for these patients who get diagnosed. So we don't just say, you know, you have Lieberman syndrome, you have this risk for cancer. There are certain things that we now do. So in childhood, you get seen by a physician every three to four months. Um, you'll get your blood pressure taken, and sometimes um, at least once a year, you'll get um, a blood panel done that's just a normal CBC that looks for different blood levels for you. We also um, do abdominal ultrasounds every three to four months, and that's to look for a certain type of tumor called an adrenal cortical carcinoma. Um, and that is you have adrenal glands that are near your kidneys, um, and these tumors sit right there. Um, so it's right in your abdomen, right near your pelvis. So we do an abdominal ultrasound. Um, and sometimes if we're not able to really look at the adrenal glands, we will also do blood work for these kids. We also do a dedicated brain MRI because one of the highest risks is for brain tumors. And then we also do a whole body MRI where we look at from the head to the toes um, to see if there's anything that's um, popping up any different types of tumors um, because any type of cancer can go along with Lee-Fermini syndrome, not just the bees. And then when you're an adult, you continue to get all of those screenings except for the abdominal ultrasound. Um, and instead we add in um, colonoscopies, which look for colorectal cancers. And then if you were assigned female at birth, you will also get breast cancer screenings. Um, so that is mammograms and MRIs um, to detect any sort of lumps or changes in the breast tissue. Um, and I wanted to do this case and um, just give a, a shout out, out to one of my favorite organizations, the Lee-Fermini Syndrome Awareness, um, because March is Lee-Fermini Syndrome Awareness Month and specifically March 20th is LFS Awareness Day. Um, and then my last case that I'm going to show you guys is a prenatal case. And this one is pretty interesting. Um, so this was not one that I personally saw, but my friend saw, and she was telling me about it. Um, so she saw a 36 year old female, um, who had had two pregnancies. Um, one pregnancy was a miscarriage and then she was currently pregnant. So that's how we denote it is G is for gestation. Um, she had two gestations and then, um, P the First number stands for the amount of pregnancies that came to term. So that's um, anyone who was born after 36 to 38 weeks. Um, pregnancies that were preterm, so anyone bef born before 36 weeks. The third number is any sort of terminations or miscarriages. And the last number is living children. So whenever we see these numbers, we're able to quickly identify how many pregnancies somebody had, how many current children they have, if there were any terminations or miscarriages, and if anybody was born um, before typical. Um, she had a ultrasound during her second trimester of pregnancy and it showed a heart defect. Um, so my friend took this family history and didn't say any sort of family history of a heart defect, but did show a family history of fertility issues. Um, so this patient, indicated by the arrow here, um, had um, a difficulty getting pregnant. She had tried for about two years to get pregnant and um, had one miscarriage um, and then was currently pregnant um, with her daughter. Um, her brother also had struggled with fertility issues. Um, they, her, him and his wife um, had tried for about five years to get pregnant and then needed assistance getting pregnant. Um, so they needed to go through um, IUI, um, which is a type of artificial insemination. Um, and the patient reported that her mom also had multiple miscarriages and also struggled with fertility. Um, so going back to what do we know, this patient had fertility issues, the first trimester screening for this patient was normal, and that's a screen that looks for things like Down syndrome, and then two um, more severe conditions called trisomy uh, 13 and trisomy 18. Um, and then we know that this ultrasound showed um, specifically a conotruncal heart defect. Um, so typically when this happens in a pregnancy, the standard thing to order is a microarray, and that looks for deletions and duplications um, that can happen across your genes on your chromosomes. Um, so in order to do this in a pregnancy, there are two ways to go about it. One is um, a CVS or chorionic villus sampling. Uh, so you can see in this picture, um, you use um, an ultrasound probe and then um, a 
biopsy catheter is inserted um, into the woman and you take a little bit of the placenta. So you take a little sample of that and that's how we can test um, the fetus to see if it has any genetic changes. Um, this can only be done up to a certain time in pregnancy, typically about um, 12 weeks. Um, so typically between like eight is really the earliest, but most of the time 10 to 12 weeks is when you would do a CVS. Anytime after that, you would try to do an amniocentesis or an amnio. And that's where you also use an ultrasound probe, but you use a very long needle and insert it into um, the woman. And then you can take a little bit of the amniotic fluid. So the fluid that's surrounding the baby um, because the baby's skin cells um, or the fetus's skin cells have shed into that amniotic fluid. Um, so in the CVS, you're testing the placenta, but in um, the amnio, you're actually testing the fluid that surrounds the fetus. Um, so the micro result came back and it showed a positive result. Um, there was a pathogenic duplication and deletion. So there was a part of um, this uh, fetus's um, ninth chromosome that was there more than once. And then another part of it that was completely gone. Um, so when we see that, there are certain things that we think of. Um, but this is a known pathogenic mutation, meaning that this goes along with the genetic condition. Um, and this goes along, um, it doesn't have a name, um, but it's a known 9P duplication, 9Q deletion. Um, and anybody with ha that has this um, might have certain conditions um, as they get older. Um, so it's been shown to be associated with autism or intellectual disability, Cardiac anomalies have never been reported, but this is the first patient that has this that does. It's decently rare. So this could just be the first person that has um, uh, a cardiac anomaly. Um, there are CNS anomalies and seizures, dysmorphic um, facial features, which just mean facial differences. Um, and prenatal anomalies are um, sometimes present like in this patient. Um, so there's a wide array of different things that can happen anywhere from autism um, to having seizures. Um, so based on having a deletion and a duplication on the same chromosome, for us, that means there's probably some sort of inversion that happened in one of the parents. So that is where a part of your chromosome is just flipped upside down. Um, and so any time there is a deletion and a duplication, this is the first thing we think of. So what does that mean? Um, that means that when your cells were div um, dividing during, I believe it's meiosis, there are crossover events that can happen. So when your chromosomes are, uh, the sister chromosomes are put together, um, they try to line up um, and cross over each other. And um, there are certain sections of your chromosomes that are a little bit more likely to do this. Um, just, just based on the repeats that happen in your DNA. Um, so when you have an inversion and part of your chromosome is flipped, um, you can see it creates this crossover loop. Um, and when that happens, you can end up with deletions and duplications because when you're crossing over, um, it's a little hard to explain, but the loop does not create um, a proper loop. And instead it flips itself. So when it's... Um, uh, being sequenced uh, to be duplicated into another cell, um, you can see in the bottom picture um, right here is probably the most um, appropriate way to look at it is with colors. And so typically you want the colors of the rainbow from red to purple. Um, but when it happens with the crossing over event that uh, occurs with the inversion loop, instead of having red to purple, you have red, orange, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. So you have that orange, red that's repeated. So now this shows a duplication of the orange and red because you have it there more than once and you're missing the um, purple and this gray color. Um, and that is the deletion that happens. So this is what happened with this patient is likely one of her parents has an inversion. And when she was, um, uh, her cells were dividing to create um, the embryo, the cells instead of having um, the red to the purple have a duplication and a deletion, if that makes sense. 
So what we did is we tested the mom or my friend tested the mom. Um, and it did show that this mom had um, an inversion karyotype, which means that she, her ninth chromosome, part of it is flipped upside down. So this gives good information for the family moving forward because any child that they subsequently get pregnant with um, might have the same genetic condition. Okay, I've officially ended this presentation. <laughs> um, so if anybody has any sort of questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. All right, let's, we'll take a look and see what's in our Q&A. <laughs> I have August who asks, what are the upcoming job outlooks for epigenetic genetics in the next five years? That is a very good question. Um, so there is definitely a lot of advancement in epigenetics, especially mm -hmm. methylation analysis. Um, so if you think about it, there are genetic um, mutations that can happen within um, your DNA, but then there are certain things that then get added on top of it. So methylation is one of those, and those are um, different changes that can turn your genes basically on and off. Um, so a lot of genetic conditions, we're learning now that they actually have methylation defects. So um, that is a pretty new, well, not super new, but an increasingly um, more broadening area. So I would say in the next five years, it's probably going to be even more. Um, so there's definitely a good outlook for um, somebody who wanted to specialize in epigenetics, especially methylation. That's probably going to be something that they can then do. There is a couple of labs actually that do specific methylation testing. Um, I don't have to send it often, but one of my friends who is a genetic counselor loves to send to that lab. Um, she's very into the methylation. So it's definitely an area that some genetic counselors have a lot of interest in. Sorry about missing the end of your presentation. I had to go check on something. Um, so Amber Jennings asked, how difficult was your job during the COVID times, like 2020, 2021? Sorry, could you repeat the first part of that? How difficult was your job during the COVID times? Gotcha. Okay. Um, my job in particular um, didn't change too much. Um, so I was working out in uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania at Penn State Health. Um, and because my job involved the care of children who do have cancer, um, nothing really changed for me. I still have to go in and see all of those patients because most of them um, are inpatient. Um, the only thing that changed was, you know, a, a lot more precautions. We had to wear masks and gowns and gloves. Um, so my job in particular didn't really change and it didn't um, get more difficult. Um, and I know a lot of genetic counselors kind of feel that a lot of um, testing and access to genetic counseling really expanded during COVID because of telehealth. Um, so a lot more people were able to see genetic counselors because they didn't have to come into the hospital. They got to um, stay home and, you know, not have to leave their job or leave their children. Um, or if they weren't physically able to get it into the hospital, they were able to still see a genetic counselor. So it really expanded a lot of access and still has. Um, but of course, a lot of genetic counselors were affected and um, a lot of layoffs happened. So um, it was a balance of it expanded access, but then also I think most areas were affected by COVID. Um, even when a specific gene hasn't been identified for a condition yet, how can genetic counseling still be beneficial for patients and their families, especially if they see it as their last hope? That is a really good question. Um, so depending on the genetic condition, there might be some clinical criteria. So even if there is not um, genetic testing that's available, you can still get a diagnosis if you meet certain clinical criteria. Um, so one of the examples is something called neurofibromatosis type 1 or NF1. There is a gene called the NF1 gene. Um, and if you have a change in that, you have NF1. But there's also clinical criteria. So if you have something called Lish nodules, which are um, a change in your eye, if you have cafe ole spots, which is a certain type of birthmark, if you have over six of them, if you have bowed legs where your legs are kind of curved, um, and you have it's called axillary or inguinal freckling, where there's freckling in your armpit or in your groin. All of those things can indicate NF1. And if you have a certain constellation of features, you can get a diagnosis. So it's very helpful to still see a geneticist or a genetic counselor to get that diagnosis. 
Um, but there's also conditions where there are no clinical criteria and we don't really know yet, but it can be helpful to see a genetic counselor to get that um, affirmation that, you know, you do have a condition. We don't know what the cause is yet, but hopefully with enough time, we can get there. And I personally um, do keep track of patients who either have not had genetic testing, but I'm suspicious they have something, um, or um, have had negative genetic testing. I keep track of some of those kids um, so that when new um, genetic testing becomes available and we get advancements, then I can contact those families um, to be like, you know, we have updated testing for you. Oh, I think you're muted. Trying to mute my coughing. <laughs> <clears throat> I hear there is treatment for some types of cancer where you remove the majority of cells that are growing uncontrollably. Why can't the, that be the treatment for all types of cancer? That's a very good question. So it really depends on the type of cancer and where it occurs. Um, so if a uh, cancer occurs in your kidney, um, or you have a renal cancer, um, you can actually sometimes remove the whole entire kidney and you can still live because you have another kidney that, um, can kind of make up for the function. But if you have a cancer that is in, um, like your pancreas, you can't completely remove your pancreas because that's the only pancreas you have. Um, and sometimes you can get surgeries to remove it. Like if you have a certain brain tumor, if it's in a certain location of your brain where the doctors are comfortable operating and removing it, um, they're able to do that. But there are certain locations of your brain that if you even touch it in a, a wrong way could cause irreparable damage, um, or death. And so sometimes it's inoperable or it's in an area that you can't do that. Or if you have leukemia, that is in your blood and you can't remove all of your blood and your bone marrow. Um, so that is another cancer that is not able to be like excised or removed because it's in um, all of your blood cells. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> you should be tested for Kells antigen. Should grandparents be tested to determine who the carrier is? That's a good question. Um, it really kind of depends. So insurance probably won't really like testing grandparents because um, if they're not of reproductive age and it won't matter, or if they're not gonna have any more children, um, insurance will be like, why am I covering this testing? Um, so instead of doing that, you don't really need to do that. But if the person who has Kell antigen, if their siblings, if they have siblings and their siblings want to have children, that is something that they could then get tested for just to make sure it's not something that they have. Um, the only reason that we would potentially test grandparents for conditions is if it affects them and their own health, or sometimes if other family members would like to um, get testing and be informed like cousins. Right. Right. Um, how closely do you work with those who do the lab testing? Good question. I work pretty closely with them. I don't work in the same place, but I, I call labs almost every day. Um, or my assistant, Cecily, calls them because she's wonderful and helps me out with that. Um, <laughs> so we do work really closely with the labs as far as um, figuring out the best test, if there's a question about a result, I'll call the labs or if I'm trying to figure out certain ways about going genetic testing. So there's um, different ways to test for things. There is something called NGS um, or Sanger sequencing or MLPA. So each one of these things is a different method to doing genetic testing and it can test for different types of mutations. So a lab can say, we'll do testing for this gene, but if it's not listed on their website, how they do it, I have to talk with them to figure out, will you be able to detect the type of mutation that I'm looking for? Um, so I do work very closely with the lab, um, but I am not physically close with them. <laughs> right, right. What high school classes do you recommend taking for this job or this pathway that you've taken? Yeah, I guess it would kind of depend on what science classes your um, high school offers. So definitely biology is helpful. Chemistry, unfortunately, is very helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, if you're, 
high school offers any like electives, um, if there is any sort of genetics, um, that's helpful. And definitely um, statistics and my dreaded enemy calculus. Yeah, yeah, math is definitely part part of the part of the game. Yes. Um, when you were at Boston University, what was your major? Um, so I majored. Let me see if I can remember in cellular and molecular biology with a speciality in genetics. I think. Um, so my I sort of had that idea of like I wanted to do something in genetics and Boston University happened to have that major so I um since I was always interested in genetics and I had thought about genetic counseling I was doing it um but I had friends like I had mentioned um my one friend was a music major and ended up being a genetic counselor because she took a bunch of science classes um and decided that's what she wanted to do so it really doesn't matter what you major in yep I I personally remember buying Leninger's Biochemistry, and it was such a big book. And I was like, I'm never going to learn all this. But by the end of it, I, I loved it, loved it, loved it. I loved Biochem. <laughs> um, how do you keep your mental fortitude when you're in a sometimes depression environment? Very good question. Um so my classmates in grad school, one of them, shout out Sarah McEwen, came up with a really good phrase that I like, and it's, you have to choose your flavor of sad. Um, so because there's so many different areas of genetic counseling, there are certain ones that really affect me more than others. So for me personally, I really could not work in the prenatal world. That really gets me. Um, I, I find it super sad and really hard to counsel those patients, and it's really emotionally taxing. Um, so I happened to really enjoy working with pediatric cancer patients. Um, and it's something that I don't internalize as much as others, but of course it's going to affect you. Um, so having a good support system, having other genetic counselors that you can talk about cases with, um, or just even team members, if you're having a hard day that you can lean on, um, having that support system in place is very helpful. And then just doing whatever you like to do for self-care, whether that's be going on walks, listening to music, binge watching reality TV and Bravo, like I like to do. Um, it, you know, you just have to um, figure out what is the best fit for you, what can you handle, and then always make sure that you are taking care of yourself. All righty. Back, back to high school. Yes. Um, what were your what were your strengths and weaknesses in high school? I think you've kind of implied. I was actually really good at math. <laughs> I just hated it. <laughs> um, so I was good at math. Um, I love to read, but I wasn't good at English. <laughs> so go figure. I, I hated the thing I was good at and loved the thing I didn't do well in. Right. That that is ironic. I would <laughs> guess the, the other way around. Um, what's one thing about your job that you're proud of? Oh, um, well, I'm really proud of my patients. Um, I'm proud of them every day. They have the hardest fight and they, the vast majority of them have such an amazing outlook on life. So I take inspiration from them every day. Um, and I'm really proud that I get to help um, give them answers a lot of the time for why this is happening to them. Um, because just having an answer for why did this happen can be really helpful if I can give it to them. Um, and helping make sure that they get the appropriate care that they need. Um, especially, you know, working in Delaware at Nemours, I'm really lucky to work around a team that is so supportive um, and really wants to do what's best for the patient. Um, and working in other places, sometimes it's either not as supportive or people just don't know as much about um, genetics in general. Um, so helping to educate people, um, I can get pretty soapboxy about this, but I get really excited to do that um, because the more you educate people, the more they're aware. Um, and I had a patient once that nobody thought to screen them for a certain type of cancer. And once I educated everybody, they did screen it, him for that type of cancer and they actually were able to catch it early enough that he didn't need any, any sort of treatment. So um, a lot of what I do is I, I don't think of it as life-saving on the day-to-day, -day, but I guess in the grand scheme of things, it sometimes can be. Right. Now you talked about something you were proud of. You talked about the good things, but what are what are the bad things uh, in your job? 
Yeah. A lot of what we're doing right now in the genetic counseling field is it feels um, like like fighting to get awareness. Um, so everybody knows what a nurse is and what a doctor is, but not a lot of people know what a genetic counselor is. Um, like there's nursing week, but genetic counselors have, we have genetic counseling awareness day <laughs> because not a lot of people even know who we are. Um, and then we also, because we are a, a fairly new field in comparison, we're having to um, lobby the government to give us re a proper reimbursement so that we can be appropriately paid. Right now, genetic counselors um, in certain states, like in Delaware, are not allowed to order our own genetic testing. Um, a doctor has to sign off on it, except we're the ones that are trained um, what tests to order and the most appropriate tests. And so sometimes if your doctor is not a geneticist that was trained in it, they don't really know um, what's best, but you do. So it's hard sometimes to have somebody else sign off on your test when you're the one that has the expertise to actually do the appropriate care. Gotcha. All right. So so we two 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 big questions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Abigail asks, as genetic testing becomes more accessible, what are the concerns surrounding access to genetic counseling, particularly for individuals from un underserved communities or with limited resources, as those individuals may very well be more prone to certain diseases, disorders. Absolutely. Um, so that's definitely something that all of us think about. Um, places like Ancestry.com and 23andMe are offering genetic testing, um, but a lot of patients aren't aware when they're going through that, that that's limited genetic testing and it doesn't test you for everything. Um, I always use, it's um, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes or BRCA1 and 2. Um, they are genes that are, um, uh, if you have a mutation in them, you have a very high risk of getting breast cancer. Um, and 23andMe will test you for that, but they really don't test you for the whole entire gene. They only test you for certain points of the gene. So you could still have a mutation and test negative on 23andMe and not know it. But unless you get clinical genetic testing, that is something that you'll never know you have. Um, so that is having patients understand that and properly being consented and counseled for that is something that's always on my mind, especially because there is a lot of medical mistrust, especially in like the Black and Hispanic communities. Um, so there's a, a lot of missing education because we have created such medical mistrust, especially in genetics. Um, if any of you have ever heard of Henrietta Lacks, you can look her up. Um, she was a Black woman who um, her cervical cells were taken um, without um, family's permission, and they were kept and used um, for studies. And she, technically, I think she's still living today because her cells live on without the permission of her family. And all of genetics is um, kind of can boil down to being tested on her cells. So there is a lot of medical mistrust that we need to kind of correct and rectify. Um, but you're right, there's a lot of um, populations, um, like in the Black community, sickle cell disease is very common. Um, and a lot of people don't um, get tested or get awareness for that. And a lot of people aren't aware that BRCA1 and 2 is also very common in Black communities. And so a lot of people should be tested for this, but maybe don't get testing because there is um, some racial bias or there is medical mistrust on the patient's part, which is understandable. Right. And then Pamela asks, and it's a perfect segue, so what are the top ethical issues your field faces? That is definitely one of them. <laughs> Um, another one is definitely, especially with what I do, I see pediatric patients who have cancer, but I am often testing them for adult onset cancer predisposition conditions. Um, my philosophy on that is these are children who have already been through cancer. I think they get to know if they might have a chance to get cancer again. And out of anybody, they are probably more equipped than some adults to get that testing because they've been through cancer. Um, and then also a lot of the times the adult onset conditions that we know about do have pediatric implications. Nobody's just ever tested children for it. Um, so that's an ethical debate that is constantly going on in um, genetic counseling. 
Um, there's also things like, um, there's so many examples, but like patients who have autism, um, a lot of them have expressed, you know, the issues of eugenics and getting tested for autism is something that they don't want to do. But a child who has autism and is nonverbal and is under the age of 18, their parents are the ones that are making those decisions. Um, so that is also a debate that everybody has had is should we really be testing children for autism for conditions that just cause autism? Or should we be testing them for conditions that cause autism plus other health conditions so that we can be aware that they might have that? So an example of that is um, if you have P10, which is a gene that if you have a mutation in it can cause autism, but also causes a, a real risk of cancer. Um, so should we only be testing children who have autism for those types of conditions, or should we be testing them for deletions and duplications that the only implication is you have this deletion and you might have autism? Um, so that is a debate that a lot of us are having too. Um, there's probably an ethical situation in every type of genetic counseling I can possibly think of, but those are some examples. Right. Um, question for me. I mm -hmm. promise it won't be too bad. What's a human chimera? That is a very good question. So um, <laughs> there's, ooh, okay, there's two different major types of that. Um, so one is when a fetus is developing, if there is a twin, sometimes you have something called, um, I think it's called a malabsorption twin event, um, where, um, one fetus absorbs the other. And so when they're born and you test their DNA, they actually have two sets of DNA. So they're technically a chimera because, um, chimera, I think it comes from Greek mythology, um, and it's the combination of two different animals. Um, and so when you have, um, a fetus and it absorbed another fetus, it technically has two sets of DNA. So that's one type, but another way we refer to that is, um, being mosaic. Um, so chimera is also like sort of a type of mosaicism. And that means that certain parts of your body have genetic changes that other parts of your body don't. So there's something called like pic 3 ca which now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if it's technically considered chimerism, but I think like it's sort of, um, it's a cool fat in fact, at least. Um, so there's a gene and it's called pic 3 ca and it's not something you can inherit from your parents. It's a brand new change that happens in you. Um, and only certain parts of your body have it. So it's something if you have a vascular malformation or a lymphatic malformation where one part of your body is swelled or you have a very large birthmark um, that has vasculature in it, um, that part of your body has a mutation in the PIK3CA gene, but the rest of your body doesn't. Um, so your mosaic technically, because that means it's kind of like a mosaic tile where you're supposed to be completely blue, but certain tiles are instead green. Um, so chimerism is similar to mosaicism in that way. Right. Okay. Last question is, uh, one of the students asked if you would be willing to share contact information yeah. through Christy or I. So to whoever, whoever it is who asked that, uh, email tgibbs at delamed.org, and then I will pass the information through. We don't ever give contact information directly. Um, oh, interesting follow-up to the human chimera. Would they have two chance, two times the chances of having cancers or different disorders? <laughs> okay, so if it's the pic 3 ca or your mosaic, not really. But I don't know about the twin malabsorption. That's a good question. Um, I guess theoretically, yes, but I'm actually not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I opened up Pandora's box. <laughs> Krista, thank you very much for joining us. Yes. Christy, good seeing you. Everybody, we will see you next week. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you.